Hello, I'm Tom Bearden, Association of Distinguished American Scientists, United States of America. I'd like to talk to you about some unknown Soviet superweapons, weapons the Soviets have secretly developed, deployed, and tested around the world, weapons that have escaped the recognition of Western scientists, intelligence agencies, and news media. These unusual Soviet-directed energy weapons are so powerful that, as Nikita Khrushchev stated in 1960, they could wipe out all life on Earth if unrestrictedly used. The weapons I am referring to use electrogravitation and a heretofore unknown type of electromagnetic wave, the time-reversed or phase conjugate wave. These strange weapons also are based on electrogravitation. They change electromagnetic force and energy into gravitational force and energy and vice versa. Electrogravitation was contained in James Clerk Maxwell's original theory of electromagnetism, but it was struck out of the theory by Oliver Heaviside after Maxwell's death. In this short briefing, I want to tell you about electrogravitation, which I call scalar electromagnetics. The Soviet Union calls it energetics. I'd like to show you what electrogravity is, how it works, and how it's been weaponized by the Soviet Union. The frightful new Soviet weapons are far more powerful than nuclear arms. I will explain how these hidden weapons have been a Trojan horse, secretly driving the disarmament negotiations between the US and the Soviet Union. I will also explain the trap being set in the present nuclear disarmament proposals and agreements that have so electrified the world. The nations of the world are tired of protracted Cold War and the unending series of small wars and deaths. Every free person yearns for true disarmament and true, true peace. Yet we simply must not be lured to our destruction by a cleverly concealed Trojan horse if true peace is to be obtained in the negotiation card game, we must force out into the hard light of day the cards that are actually being held by the parties to the negotiations. That is precisely what I propose to do in this presentation. I urge you to listen to the material presented and then make up your own mind. We are at a decisive crossroad in human history. If we carefully take the correct road, there is still hope for the survival of the peoples of the earth. If we thoughtlessly take the wrong road, then the past two great world wars were child's play compared to the destruction that will inevitably come. Let us start now with the lost unified field theory of, Glenn, of James Clerk Maxwell. We will present just a little technical material then get into the main presentation. Please bear with me. Maxwell's original theory was expressed in quaternion-like mathematics. In the quaternion theory, when vector operations sum or multiply to a zero resultant, a scalar component may remain. Indeed, the scalar remainder is a function of the vector components of the zero resultant system. For example, Suppose we have a circuit or a device which creates a cross product of two vectors. Say, for example, the electric fields of two single frequency electromagnetic waves. Further, suppose we feed in two interacting identical waves so that the cross product of their E fields results. In conventional electromagnetics, using vector analysis, the output, of course, is a zero resultant E field. That is, the two E fields interacting in that fashion will not translate or push charged matter, such as electrons. Now suppose that the magnetic fields of the two waves also are identical and also interact to produce a cross product. Again, a zero resultant magnetic field results, and so this system of magnetic vectors will not swirl charged matter, such as electrons. Classically, we have been taught that when charged matter is not pushed or translated away or swirled, there is no electromagnetic field acting on it. That is not necessarily true at all. 
In fact, the charged matter may be subjected to a squeeze compression or a stretch rarefaction electromagnetically without translating or swirling it. In the case of our two identical vectors, in the physical world, the stress of one vector pushing on another produces a squeeze or stretch. This squeeze, without translation or swirl, is gravitational in nature because dynamically it increases and decreases the local energy of the vacuum by adding its own energy. It simply represents an oscillation of the local virtual particle flux of vacuum. In our example we used, this squeeze wave is captured by the scalar component of the quaternion. So Maxwell's original quaternion theory contained the ability to convert electromagnetic forces to electromagnetic squeezes or to gravitation. After Maxwell's death, a single scientist, Oliver Heaviside, finished vector analysis. He then single-handedly translated Maxwell's theory into his new vectors. Heaviside simply discarded the bothersome scalar component of the quaternion to ease his calculations. In so doing, he unknowingly discarded electrogravitation. Now gravitation is simply enfolded and trapped electromagnetic energy. Rigorously, it is electromagnetic squeeze. It is like pressure in a gas. Electromagnetic energy, on the other hand, is simply the outfolded contents of gravitational energy. It is like the bleed off of gas pressure through an opening in a pressurized container. Gravitational potential consists of the locked up or locked in electromagnetic force fields. An electromagnetic force field is a single unlocked bleed off of standing squeeze or stress waves of gravitational potential. Gravitational waves are standing waves, scalar electromagnetic wave systems with zero E and B field resultants. A zero vector wave passes through the electron shells of an atom into its nucleus. There, the electrogravitational wave is absorbed, raising the potential of the nucleus to an excited state. The excited nucleus then decays, emitting a time-reversed scalar wave back through the electron shells. Thus, electrogravitational waves are exchanged between the nuclei of atoms primarily. This is a continual process between all nuclei of the universe. These scalar waves represent significant oscillations of the local curvature of space-time, something that Einstein assumed could not be done on the laboratory bench. Indeed, it can easily be done using the principles we have stated. The Soviet Union discovered electrogravitation shortly after World War II and developed a secret armada of powerful superweapons based upon it. Let us look at the history, briefly, of the secret Soviet scalar electromagnetic weapons. At the end of World War II, the Soviet Union obtained the cream of the crop of Germany's radar scientists and infrared scientists. At that time, the German scientific team led the world in the theory and technology of radar absorbing materials, RAM it's called, and radar cross-section. For example, some leading Western radar experts believe that the German scientists had already advanced the theory of radar cross-section beyond where Western scientists have arrived at today. Radar cross-section science, as we all know, is the heart of modern radar technology, countermeasures and counter-countermeasures. The theory of RAM technology is precisely what is needed to develop and design phase conjugate mirrors for radar frequency bands. A phase conjugate mirror is simply a nonlinear material that is capable of producing a time-reversed or TR wave in direct response to a received or absorbed ordinary wave. The mirror may also be powerfully pumped with energy to produce a very large amplification of the emitted time-reversed wave. Just after World War II, the Soviets mounted a truly massive program to obtain and review all the scientific literature of the West. 
This material was completely re-examined and digested in a deliberate search for a major new technological breakthrough area. Absolutely nothing similar to this has ever been done in the West. By 1950, the Soviets had discovered phase conjugation in the time-reversed wave in their radar programs using the German radar scientists. The time-reversed wave itself is a solution to the wave equation, and hence the phenomenon is universal to all waves and frequency regions under appropriate nonlinear circumstances. It has been done, for example, with sound waves. It is not a matter of frequency, but it can apply to any kind of wave at any frequency. We stress the fact that the Soviets have always led the rest of the world in many nonlinear aspects of science and mechanics from the beginning. Thus, by the mid-50s, the Soviets mounted an intensive national development program on these radar time-reversed wave weapons. The Soviet Union has now had the equivalent of some seven or eight Manhattan projects back-to-back -back in the development, stockpiling, and deployment of TR wave weapon systems. At least fifth generation Soviet TR weapons have been developed and deployed, and they have been hot tested to include actual destruction of free world missiles and aircraft. This is a matter of the greatest importance to the free world, and one which Western intelligence, scientific, and news communities have largely missed. We particularly stress that the time-reversed wave phenomenon is a universal phenomenon of nature. It is not just a fluke and not just a nonlinear optics phenomenon. It is a general solution to the wave equation and as such applies to every kind of wave, electromagnetic, sound, magnetohydrodynamic, mechanical, and other radiating systems all exhibit the phenomenon under the appropriate nonlinear conditions. Hundreds of Western papers dealing with time-reversed waves are now in the open scientific literature, most of them dealing with nonlinear optics. However, the principles are well established and known to apply to waves in general. Now, a time-reversed wave has startlingly different weapon capabilities compared to a normal electromagnetic wave. Such a wave is stimulated in a nonlinear material by a strike or an emergence or an absorption of a regular positive time wave. Such a wave precisely retraces the path of the ordinary wave that stimulated it to be formed. So it possesses what is in effect an invisible wire through space back to the original position of whatever emitted that stimulus wave. Further, the time-reversed wave really is time-reversed. It does not dissipate or spread its energy. Instead, it continually converges upon its invisible backtracking path. It does not diverge in contra contradistinction to normal electromagnetic waves. Now, this characteristic makes it ideal to use in firing slugs of electromagnetic energy, what are called electromagnetic missiles, against a distant target, even one that is thousands of miles away from the emitter. Using several simple schemes, particularly pumped four-wave mixing, extremely large amplification of the time-reversed wave can be cheaply and readily accomplished. A startling weapons capability therefore emerges when amplified TR waves are generated in response to the received weak signals from a distant target. First, if any signal at all can be received from that distant target, a return time reverse signal of extreme power can be delivered directly to that target. Almost all of the transmitted time reversed wave energy will arrive at and in that distant target, even through a highly nonlinear medium or under scattering conditions. Hardly any of the energy will be lost en route. If the target is fast moving, a lead correction signal can be calculated and added to steer the return path. Second, real-time holography can readily be accomplished using time-reversed waves 
and without first making holograms. In addition, by using pumped four-way mixing, as much energy as one desires can be placed into the distant hologram, including even negative energy, which cancels an equal amount of positive energy. Powerful geometrical forms, balls, shapes, hemispherical shells, and so forth, of electromagnetic energy can be created at a distance quite readily by interferometry or crossed beam techniques using time-reversed waves. Since the TR wave carriers do not disperse with distance, these interference energy forms can be assembled by crossing TR wave beams at great distances, even at thousands of miles. In theory, the energy appearing in such a distantly created energy form is limited only by the amount one cares to put in at the amplified transmitting end and by the state of the art of the technology in developing the mirror. Thus, the radar itself becomes now a powerful all-around weapon with a TR wave adjunct once the radar receives a weak return signal from a target, an extremely powerful time-reversed wave pulse can be generated, and all the energy in that pulse can be unerringly returned to the distant target from which the return was received. Crossed beam over-the-horizon radars, such as the giant Soviet woodpecker transmitters, are ideal for use as carriers of wires for distant time-reversed wave interferometry. Even a passive receive-only radar may be used together with a TR wave adjunct to accomplish the same directed energy destruction of the distant target emitting the signals received by the radar. Radio receiver transmitters may also employ simple TR wave adjuncts to provide a large number of communication jammers and directed energy weapons capable of jamming and or destroying enemy radio transmitters at appreciable distances. The Soviets have intensely developed such time-reversed wave weapons since the 1950s. In January 1960, Khrushchev was referring to these weapons when he reported to the Soviet Presidium the forthcoming advent of fantastic weapons, then in advanced Soviet development. Prior to Khrushchev's announcement, the Soviets had begun radiating the U.S. Embassy in Moscow with scalar electromagnetic waves and phase conjugate energy, modulated upon weak microwave carrier beams. Later, these beams were used to induce illnesses and blood changes in embassy personnel. We will shortly discuss how the Soviets could induce disease at a distance electromagnetically. The microwave radiation continued intermittently in spite of the objections of several U.S. presidents, U.S. scientific studies failed to comprehend what was being done. The embassy radiation was and is a high-level Soviet intelligence probe. Stimulate and affect the U.S. ambassador, a high-level target. Attention by the CIA, NSA, State Department, DIA, the U.S. president, and so forth is guaranteed. Puzzled? They will turn to the U.S. scientific community for an explanation. The scientific community will try to explain the microwave radiation using the best of its knowledge. By the U.S. counteractions taken or not taken at the U.S. embassy site, the Soviets knew with 100% certainty whether or not the U.S. had discovered time-reversed wave weapons, electromagnetic disease control, and so forth and they knew whether the U.S. 
had developed defenses against such weapons. Since the beginning, of course, U.S. counteractions, or the like of them, at the U.S. Embassy have consistently revealed to the Soviets the true status of U.S. knowledge of scalar electromagnetics. The U.S. Shown, has shown that it has no knowledge of, and hence no defenses against, time-reversed wave technology and the electrogravitation that accompanies it. Soviet TR wave radar weapons also provide a convenient mechanism for accomplishing nuclear weapon kills. A target struck by a powerful TR wave pulse generates a time-reversed back pulse due to nonlinearities in the target medium. In the nonlinear medium of the exploding or fusing target, the two pulses, which are 180 degrees out of phase with each other in time, modulate and lock together as a scalar EM wave or pulse. This scalar EM pulse has zero electromagnetic force field resultants, but it is a violent fluctuation of the local energy density of space-time. Rigorously, it is a local gravitational pulse wave by definition. Further, it is far more powerful than normal gravitational waves since the stress is in the time dimension. And when you stress the time dimension or change the stress on the time dimension, you uh, curve space-time very much in general relativity. This scalar EM pulse does not react with the orbital electron shells of an atom, but passes directly into the nucleus and is absorbed there. This raises the nucleus to an excited state, increasing its potential or trapped energy. If the nucleus cannot withstand this increase in potential energy, it directly fissions. If the nucleus withstands that potential, it then immediately decays from the excited state by simply emitting a time-reversed electromagnetic wave. Now, any radioactive nucleus is already teeter-tottering toward nuclear decay, so to speak, and it will instantly decay radioactively when struck by a significant scalar potential pulse. Thus, a TR wave radar weapon can deliver a powerful TR pulse against a distant vehicle carrying a nuclear warhead and the resultant electrogravitational pulse penetrating the nuclear material of the warhead will electrogravitationally explode it in a full order nuclear detonation. Therefore, when using such weapons, extreme care must be taken to avoid inadvertently pulsing one's own nearby nuclear weapons or nuclear material. In attacking distant ground targets, one must be careful not to detonate nearby nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants, or stored nuclear material, even at some distance from the target. Otherwise, large-scale nuclear fallout will be experienced over a wide area from the resulting explosions. An unacceptable boomerang self-damage to the attacker himself may be incurred. The more powerful the TR wave pulse employed, the greater the safety separation between the struck target and stored nuclear material must be to prevent the unacceptable boomerang large-scale nuclear fallout. Now, because of extensive Western nuclear deployment, up to now, the Soviet Union has been unable to heavily bring to bear its giant TR wave weapons. Their extensive use would inevitably detonate many of the Western nuclear weapons in place. The resulting worldwide nuclear fallout would devastate all nations, including the Soviet Union. And that is precisely what is driving the sudden and sweeping nuclear disarmament campaign by the Soviet Union. It sees a golden opportunity to thin out Western nuclear deployment and free the restraints on using its giant continent-busting scalar electromagnetic weapons. Large TR wave interferometry weapons, such as the woodpecker signals and systems, usually first produce very powerful scalar EM standing wave beams by continuously transmitting into the carrier beam both a normal EM wave and its phase conjugate. These two beams, 180 degrees out of phase in the time dimension, but not in the space dimension, are modulated or locked together to produce a standing zero EM vector resultant electrogravitational wave. This produces space-time curvature mostly upon the time dimension, which is by far the most significant for curvature in general relativity. 
Interference of two of these standing scalar EM wave beams in the targeted area, plus internal scanning within individual EM components of the beams by other transmitted modulation signals, allows electromagnetic effects of either electromagnetic energy or time-reversed electromagnetic energy to be produced and controlled at very precise locations within the broad interference area. Such giant standing scalar electromagnetic waves can be established in space, in the atmosphere, in the ocean, or in the earth, since these beams travel through the nuclei of the atoms as their medium. Each such huge scalar EM standing wave beam represents, in fact, a gigantic electrogravitational standing wave, and hence a giant oscillating stress potential in space-time. This standing wave represents a sort of gigantic capacitor or accumulator of infolded electromagnetic stress energy. Enormous energy may be collected in this potential, charged up over a period of time. Now short out of this giant capacitor by transmitter failure can result in a large flashover discharge of the electrogravitational energy into the local earth at the stricken transmitter producing a massive electrogravitational ground wave that can strike nuclear facilities and be enormously destructive. Thus, one must carefully protect the TR wave weapon system from an inadvertent discharge of large electrogravitational pulses into the Earth at the site due to transmitter failure, short outs, and so forth. Otherwise, one's own nuclear weapons or facilities may be exploded, even at some distance, by the electrogravitational pulse ground wave that is produced. One's communications and electronics installations, for example, can be knocked out at even greater distance. For example, in the winter of 1957-58, one or more large Soviet TR wave prototype weapons at Kishtim, near the Urals, suffered catastrophic transmitter failure discharging a powerful scalar electrogravitational pulse into the Earth. This huge electrogravitational pulse struck the atomic waste stored nearby, causing all the radioactive nuclei to immediately decay. In other words, the nearby atomic waste exploded, just as interrogated personnel from the region reported. Deadly radioactive contamination spread across a major region of the Soviet Union by fallout and the area is strongly contaminated to this day. After this accident, the Soviets developed much more elaborate safety circuits and devices and implemented them into their time-reversed wave weapons. Even so, in April 1986, the explosive eruption of a reactor at Chernobyl was almost certainly caused by an accidental catastrophic failure of a large time-reversed wave woodpecker transmitter about 30 kilometers away. The sudden failure of the east to west woodpecker transmitter was positively detected in the field by engineer William Bice. All safety si uh, circuits at the site would have been instantly activated, desperately and slowly draining off the huge standing wave potential built up by that weapon. The Soviets would also have immediately shut down the nearby reactors at Chernobyl as a precaution. However, in a shutdown reactor, the radioactive uranium fuel rods are still physically present. Some hours later, the transmitter safety devices finally failed, and a much smaller, though still significant, remnant electrogravitational pulse was discharged into the Earth, spreading out in a ground wave. The first radioactive material it encountered was the fuel rods in one of the hapless, shutdown Chernobyl reactors. The fuel rods received the electrogravitational pulse and violently erupted in a burst of radioactivity, rupturing the plant. Had the full electrogravitational pulse escaped that tr uh, stricken transmitter, all four reactors at Chernobyl would have violently exploded and extensive and deadly nuclear fallout would have rained down over a wide area of the Earth. Had the reactors not been shut down, and the control rods inserted full in to dampen the radioactivity, a far greater, greater radioactive eruption, probably a nuclear explosion, of the struck reactor would have occurred.
In the middle of the 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake that hit six weeks ago in Chile, the biggest earthquake anywhere in the world in 50 years. What we did not know at the time of that quake was that in the middle of that giant quake, there was a team of American officials inside that country, inside Chile, on a top secret mission to save the world from nuclear disaster. It sounds melodramatic, right? It's actually not an exaggeration. In the days before that earthquake hit, a team of U.S. officials were in Chile on a mission to secure 40 pounds of radioactive, highly enriched uranium. They were to obtain it, secure it, and transfer it safely to the United States, all in secret. This 40 pounds of highly enriched uranium was being stored at two facilities. Now, 40 pounds of this stuff is considered to be enough to destroy part of a major city if it were detonated, which would not be the hardest thing in the world to do. So you obviously can't just pick this stuff up, throw it in a suitcase, and hop on a plane back to the United States. U.S. and Chilean officials had to extract the uranium racks from these ionized pools they were stored in. They then transferred them into specially designed casks. The casks were lined with eight inches of lead and steel to keep the uranium safe in transit. 60 tons of metal were used to secure just 40 pounds of uranium. Package and handle this stuff the wrong way, and you can set off a spontaneous nuclear chain reaction. Time magazine reports it was only 12 hours after the team got the uranium into those casks and surrounded it with 1,500-pound protective impact limiters. Just 12 hours after that, the giant 8.8 .8 impact, a.k.a. earthquake, hit. Well packed for shipping, the uranium was safe in the quake. If there had been a spontaneous nuclear chain reaction, you probably would have heard about it by now. But the earthquake did render totally unusable the port that these scientists were going to use to ship out this secret nuclear cargo. After a recon mission that involved the head of the Chilean nuclear agency personally driving himself to one uranium site to check on its safety, the scientists worked through the night to find a new escape route. They decided to use a port 50 miles to the north of the one they had initially planned. Cue a dark of night convoy to the new port through an earthquake ravaged countryside with no electricity and a desperate attempt to get this uranium out of the country safely. Again, all while keeping it secret. Despite major aftershocks, the uranium made it to the new port safely. But then, more drama. One of the cranes that was being used, look at this, one of the cranes being used to hoist this unstable, highly radioactive material onto the American ship malfunctioned, sent the container swinging, flying out of control just yards above the deck. Ultimately, they regained control, and the uranium was loaded onto two specially outfitted double-hulled American ships. They put it on two ships so they would have split the material, so neither of the ships would be carrying enough highly enriched uranium to make a bomb. The ships then embarked on a two-and-a-half-week Coast Guard-escorted journey to the United States, including an ulcer-inducing trip through the Panama Canal. Their ultimate destination, South Carolina, where the uranium is painstakingly converted to safer non-weapons-grade fuel. With the moratorium ending on telling the story of Chile's uranium in the earthquake, today in Washington, leaders of 47 countries gathered for the biggest summit in the United States in more than six decades. It's a two-day gathering aimed at addressing the issue of global nuclear security. And right at the beginning of day one of this summit, some results to be announced. Today, Ukraine announced a landmark decision to get rid of all of its stockpile of highly enriched uranium by the time of the next nuclear security summit in 2012. Ukraine will eliminate its entire stockpile of highly enriched uranium. After Press Secretary Robert Gibbs made that announcement, President Obama and the Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych released a joint statement, which reads, quote, President Yanukovych announced Ukraine's decision to get rid of all of its stocks of highly enriched uranium, while the United States will provide necessary technical and financial assistance to support this effort. Sound familiar? The United States will provide technical and financial assistance to support this effort. Hopefully this time, minus the earthquakes. In May 1960, a prototype TR wave radar weapon was used to down Gary Powers' high-flying U-2 aircraft over the Soviet Union. 
Powers reported a flash as if from an explosion near him, but the flash persisted. This is almost certainly the signature of a TR wave weapon. In April 1963, the first large strategic Soviet TR wave weapons became operational on site. These weapons were used to electromagnetically deaden the electrical controls of the USS Thresher atomic submarine on April the 10th, 1963, and they were also used to produce a huge underwater electromagnetic blast 100 miles north of Puerto Rico on April the 11th, 1963. Since scalar electromagnetics travels directly through the nuclei of materials, the ocean is transparent to scalar EM beams. Soviet Admiral Gorshkov publicly stated on at least one occasion that we have made the oceans of the world transparent. Since the 1960s, the Soviets have possessed a 100% effective defense against U.S. and European strategic bombers and missiles, just as they stated in the 1968 Soviet book, Military Strategy. The early systems deployed in the Soviet Union were mid-course and terminal phase systems. The Soviets also relied upon additional TR wave weapon systems deployed as adjuncts to radar systems aboard research ships and trawlers to be able to attack U.S. missiles and bombers in their launch and early mid-course phase. Huge light phenomena from the extensive testing of these ship-mounted Scalar EM Soviet weapons have been observed at sea for decades. Hundreds of incidents of Soviet tests of these TR wave weapon systems have been observed around the world and reported in the open literature as puzzling or anomalous light phenomena. These Soviet defensive TR wave weapon systems also easily accomplish, as we said, nuclear weapon kill. Further, by their nature, they have long provided an antidote to counter the stealth aircraft technology. The thousands of deployed older Soviet radars using TR wave adjuncts become totally new weapons, having startling and unsuspected capabilities against missiles and aircraft. For that reason, the Soviets happily continue to operate and maintain a number of these older systems that, by Western radar standards, are seemingly obsolete. By adding a TR wave adjunct, however, each of these radars immediately becomes a microwave directed energy weapon of formidable power. In the 1960s, to turn our attention to other matters, the Soviet scientist Vlail Koznashev and his researchers accomplished enormous experimentation and proved that cellular death and disease of any type whatsoever could be transmitted and induced electromagnetically. It follows that this team would have gone on secretly to phase conjugate or time reverse the death photon signals to show that any cellular death or disease can be reversed or cured electromagnetically as well. The latter work would have been done under the auspices and tight control of the Soviet KGB since all phase conjugation or time reverse weapons are under that agency for development, deployment, and employment. Now, obviously, the electromagnetic antidote work of Koznashev was not published because it provided a powerful counter-biological warfare capability of great strategic importance to the Soviet Union. Thus, in the late 1960s, the Soviet Union became the only nation on Earth to achieve the capability of rapidly developing, within one or two hours, an electromagnetic antidote for any lethal new biological warfare viruses or bacteria of any kind whatsoever. The Soviets also developed the capability for mass treatment in this fashion of both the civil population and its military forces personnel. Now, independent verification of the Koznashev death photons effect has been accomplished in West Germany at the University of Marburg, in Australia at the University of Sydney and in the United States. Koznashev now works directly with a secret Soviet research organization in the outskirts of Moscow. At this facility, microwave-directed energy weapons are feverishly developed. The clear implication is that microwave weapons, such as the giant woodpecker over-the-horizon radar systems, are being modified to deliver cellular death and disease patterns against targeted distant populations even halfway around the Earth. Now, this kind of effect has been proven. In the 1960s and early 70s, a French inventor, Antoine Priori, built and tested several large electromagnetic devices that cured thousands of cases of terminal cancers and leukemias in laboratory animals. It also cured sleeping sickness. 
He worked with members of the prestigious French Academy of Sciences. His work was funded by the French government and presented to the French Academy by Robert Courier, head of the biology section. Priori's work was suppressed in the mid-70s and lost when he died. Priori used a plasma to accomplish multi-wave mixing and phase conjugation or time reversal. His time-reversed curative signals used a powerful rippling magnetic field as a carrier, as a wire, so to speak. The magnetic field guaranteed penetration of every cell in the body, even in the bone marrow, and that was necessary to reach a blood disease such as leukemia. The rippling of the magnetic field guaranteed penetration of the cell's atomic nuclei by nuclear magnetic resonance. Penetration of the actual nuclei of the atoms in the diseased cells is necessary since the master cellular control system discovered by Dr. Fritz Albert Popp of West Germany operates through the cell's structured scalar EM biopotential. This potential is centered in the nuclei of the atoms comprising the cell. Note that electrical dedifferentiation and redifferentiation of cells by a minuscule current between picoamperes and nanoamperes has been beautifully proven by Dr. Robert Becker and other researchers. Red cells of the frog, for example, have been electrically reversed through all their development stages. The cells first become round, then develop a scalloped outline. Then they become amoeboid and move by means of pseudopods. Their nuclei swell and their DNA becomes reinactivated. They then rid themselves of all their hemoglobin and develop a full set of mitochondria and ribosomes. In Becker's historic experiments, the cells then turned into cartilage-forming cells and finally into bone-forming cells, healing difficult bone fractures. In short, Becker demonstrated cell dedifferentiation followed by redifferentiation into an unrelated cell type, all electrically initiated and controlled with laughably weak currents. Thus, profound cellular changes are most certainly inducible and controllable electromagnetically by minuscule amounts of potentials and currents. Priori's machine applied time-reversed EM waves to accomplish reversal from cancerous cells back to normal cells. Priori's work essentially proved that Kosnashev's group would have been able to accomplish the same thing by phase conjugation. Also, Kosnashev's death photon's work was accomplished much, much earlier than reported in the open literature. It provided a basis to use in the microwave radiation of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow to engender blood changes and disease in the targeted personnel. Two U.S. ambassadors died from a leukemia-like disease, and a third sickened and bled from the ears and nose and eventually died of leukemia. Significant blood changes and genetic effects were noted in embassy personnel. Only minuscule levels of electromagnetic signals would have been necessary to induce such detrimental biological changes. The present woodpecker signals undoubtedly have the capability of producing similar conditions in distant targeted populations, and much more whenever the Soviets wish to add the appropriate signals. These weapons also are capable of killing large numbers of the targeted population whenever appropriate Kosnashev death signals are placed upon them. In the late 1960s, another cautious Soviet intelligence probe was used. Papers appeared in the open Soviet literature dealing with time-reversed wave, uh, waves in the field of nonlinear optics. Only a few American optical scientists seemed to be interested. In 1972, to focus more U.S. attention on their subtle intelligence probe of U.S. time-reversed wave knowledge, the Soviets sent two scientists to Lawrence Livermore Laboratory to brief American scientists on optical phase conjugation. Now thereafter, many U.S. optical scientists began to work in the, quote, new field, unquote. Immediately, it was revealed to the Soviet Union that the U.S. had ineffective knowledge of phase conjugation and that the U.S. had no time-reversed wave we uh, technology or weapons. To this day, Western theoretical work in phase conjugation is still largely characterized by a simple overall math model obtained by simply writing down the necessary conjugate term in the wave equation. There appears to be absolutely no U.S. awareness of the physical electrogravitational mechanism in the atomic nucleus itself that causes the phase conjugation time reversal, and there appears to be no theory of that as such. Its direct re application to radar-directed energy weapons appears to have largely been ignored in the West. The West has focused on lasers and optics. 
1975, the Soviets attempted to obtain a treaty with the rest of the world, outlawing the development of frightful new weapons of mass destruction, even more frightful than the mind of man had ever imagined, according to Brezhnev himself. Gromyko introduced a draft treaty into the 1975 session of the United Nations General Assembly. No one in the West knew what the Soviets were referring to. Failing to obtain the treaty, the Soviets in 1975-76 embarked on the greatest military buildup in history. This buildup was nothing short of a full-fledged preparation to be ready to dominate the world. The year 1985 was set as the ready time according to Leonid Brezhnev's 1972 statement at a secret Prague meeting of European Communist Party leaders. The Soviets met this 1985 scheduled goal. As we stated, the Soviets can be immune to any type of viral biological warfare any time they choose to be. The use of lethal new viruses thus has become a highly favored low-risk method of warfare for the Soviet Union and for no other nation on Earth. The West has no such capability against viral warfare and in fact is totally vulnerable to attack in this manner. Both Western troops and Western civil populations are totally defenseless against the threat of viral biological attack. A BW strike from a small hostile nation or even from a few radical terrorists or even an inadvertent contaminant spillage from one of the great many ill-controlled private genetic experiments can result in the introduction of a lethal highly infectious new virus that will decimate the West. Indeed, a biological warfare viral attack may already have been unleashed on the world. In 1971, the U.S. passed the National Cancer Act and declared open warfare on cancer. Iron Curtain scientists were invited to participate, and they did so with alacrity. At the same time, ironically, penetration of Western recombinant DNA genetics research was one of the highest priorities of the Soviet KGB. Many KGB scientists and agents were infiltrated into our labs under this program. Some cancer research labs at Fort Detrick, Maryland, for example, still to this day employ more communists than American scientists. In these cancer labs, animal viruses were repeatedly injected and re-injected into human cell cultures until new viral strains emerged that preferred human cells as hosts. These adapted viruses could then be cultured, and the effects or lack of effects of various chemicals and drugs against them could be ascertained. This is all a necessary part of the legitimate war on cancer. However, these new viruses are exactly what one would wish to develop if one were seeking a biological warfare virus to which humans were not resistant, and one which preferred humans as its host. Sometime during the early 1970s, KGB agents who had infiltrated U.S. cancer research laboratories may have deliberately contaminated the World Health Organization's smallpox vaccine with one or more of the lethal new viruses freely available in the Western cancer laboratories, available to them because they were working in those laboratories. Massive smallpox vaccination in Africa and other third world countries then resulted in the appearance and spread of the AIDS disease. Now, if this thesis is true, then AIDS constitutes the first Soviet biological warfare strike against the West in what can only be categorized as an opening round in a unique new World War III. With the Kosnashev techniques, the Soviet KGB already has the effective electromagnetic antidote against AIDS and other lethal viruses any time it wishes to employ it. Some Soviet citizens may die with AIDS, however, to serve as a deception plan and conceal the true Soviet electromagnetic anti-biological uh, warfare capability. Meanwhile, the third world nations and the West will be devastated by the killer disease. Now, as if this were not enough, today there is even a British firm which will tailor make a virus by computerized gene splicing techniques, and it will sell that virus to any purchaser for $10,000. Hosts of poorly controlled or uncontrolled persons and laboratories are experimenting today with recombinant genetics all over the world. Much of the residue from these experiments is dumped into the biosphere to eventually produce innumerable recombinations and new viruses. Inevitably, some of these new viruses will be lethal and even fast acting. So many other lethal viruses are almost certain to follow AIDS, whether from covert warfare strikes fanatical terrorist groups, or inadvertent private contamination. 
Undoubtedly, some of these frightful new viruses are not going to be slow viruses or lentiviruses. Some will likely be highly infectious and quick-acting in the manner of some influenzas. Some will be transmitted successfully by insect vectors such as the voracious New Asian tiger mosquito now spreading across the southeast U.S. Now, beginning in July 1976, powerful new Soviet over-the-rise radars, the infamous woodpeckers, became operational. Extensive weather engineering over the U.S. had been accomplished by these weapon systems. Now, this has been separately documented by the present author, by C.B. Baker, editor of Youth Action News, Andrew Mikrowski of Canada's Planetary Association for Clean Energy, and other researchers such as Andrea Puharich. In addition, the woodpeckers possess the full range of TR wave weapon capabilities, including real-time holography capabilities and anti-stealth capabilities. Terrible anti-biological capabilities are also possessed by these weapon systems, and they are also highly effective as global launch phase and mid-course phase defensive weapons for use against U.S. missiles and bombers. In the launch phase, for example, track the missile as it's slowly rising, send it a huge pulse of TR wave or time-reversed wave energy, scratch one missile. In November 1985, the Soviets completed wet-run weapon tests against U.S. missiles and aircraft and at least three of NASA's, NASA's shuttle launches, employing the woodpeckers in the launch phase, ABM, and anti-bomber mode. Now, in the target year, 1985, beginning in December, actual destruction of selected U.S. missiles and aircraft was accomplished. Targets destroyed by the Soviets included the Arrow DC-8 at Gander Air Force Base, Newfoundland, on December the 12th, 1985. This is 2020. Tonight, remember this, Gander, Newfoundland. 248 U.S. soldiers killed in an air tragedy. Shattered families consoled by the president. Tragedy is nothing new to mankind, but somehow it's always a surprise. The official ruling, an accident. But was it, or did terrorists cause the worst air disaster in military history that no one survived? Then, in a major 2020 investigation, Lynn Sher re-examines the case. What caused the crash? One report says it was ice, but yet there's no proof that it was ice. It's just all theory. Were witnesses brushed off? Was evidence ignored? The hole blown through the fuselage strongly suggests that an explosion took place on board the airplane while it was still in flight. And the theory that could rock the nation. Do you really believe that Iran Contra figures in that air crash? I think there's a, a strong possibility, and I think we need answers to these questions. The tragedy at Gander. What really happened? Targets destroyed by the Soviets included the shuttle Challenger launched on January 28, 1986, the Titan 34D rocket launched on April 18, 1986, a U.S. Delta 178 rocket launched on May 3, 1986, and the French Ariane 2 rocket launched in late May 1986. In addition, a Nike Orion research rocket misfired over the New Mexico desert on April 25, 1986. This was the first failure of that rocket in 25 consecutive launches. During the same period, that is early in 1986, a spate of crashes of French military aircraft occurred over a four-month period, causing French Defense Minister André Giraud to open a special investigation. Giraud may have discussed the possibility of Soviet sabotage of that rocket with Washington. Two U.S. nuclear submarines, one of them the USS Atlanta in the Straits of Gibraltar, mysteriously ran aground, perhaps due to unsuspected interference with their guidance and navigation systems. In July 1986, a highly secret U.S. Air Force aircraft, possibly a stealth fighter, crashed near Bakersfield, California. The crippled aircraft was seen in trouble and photographed by Andy Hoyt. The aircraft was not on fire when it came down and it did not explode in the air. It gave the uh, attributes of a scalar electromagnetic uh, interference with its control systems. Another loss of a possible stealth fighter occurred in 1987. Loss of these two secret aircraft may have been due to Soviet testing of time-reversed weapon capabilities and anti-stealth capabilities of the Soviet woodpecker weapon system. Now, hosts of other anomalous and mysterious incidents indicative of Soviet phase conjugate TR wave weapon utilization on a massive scale occurred in 1986. These are documented in my 1985 book, Ferdy Lance, 
and in my forthcoming book, AIDS, Biological Warfare. However, a severe limitation on the unrestricted use of time-reversed wave weapons exists. If powerfully and unrestrainedly used, they will cause nuclear warheads and nuclear material to explode as surface nuclear bursts in the dirtiest possible fashion. The resulting massive radioactive fallout would probably wipe out all higher forms of life on Earth. Note that in 1960, Nikita Khrushchev actually stated that these fantastic weapons could wipe out all life on Earth if unrestrainedly used. As long as we possess an appreciable deployment and stockpile of nuclear weapons, we are essentially dead man fused against substantial Soviet usage of these powerful weapons. Thus, Mikhail Gorbachev needs to thin out the deployed and stored Western nuclear warheads to allow a more unrestrained field of play for his decisive TR wave weapons. That is why at Reykjavik, he suddenly expressed full interest in President Reagan's zero option, even expressing agreement with the principle of on-site inspection to ensure dismantling of missiles and removal of warheads. That is why the Soviets are so actively interested in the withdrawal of nuclear weapons from Europe and negotiating a strategic nuclear reduction treaty. Using their scalar EM weaponry, they can quickly and easily take Europe with impunity the moment the nuclear weapons are thinned out and Western dead man fusing is removed. So we can now understand what is driving the present steps in nuclear disarmament and towards the kinds of nuclear treaties that are being negotiated. We are referring in these weapons to a new kind of blitzkrieg warfare, war conducted by powerful beams and long-range destruction engendered at the speed of light. NATO can be defeated in two hours or less, and the entire war, mop up and all, would last perhaps three days. Of course, powerful demonstrations of Soviet superweapons could be provided to show that attempted nuclear retaliation would simply be suicide. The woodpecker weapon systems alone could wipe out all major communication systems and power systems in the U.S., induce waves of EM-induced death and disease in pre-announced locations, induce waves of abject fear and panic in the populace, or psychologically disrupt and disable, say, the Washington, D.C. area, to include the people, the government, and the Pentagon. If such a scenario were accompanied by proclaiming a Soviet equivalent to the Monroe Doctrine, except applying it to Europe, offer of a ceasefire, and an offer to allow us a Dunkirk to evacuate the beaten remnants of our forces, the U.S. and NATO would almost certainly be forced to accept Soviet terms for a ceasefire that left the U.S. and Europe intact. In fact, the U.S. Congress, reacting with alacrity to accept this sudden and apparently miraculous Soviet leniency and avoid the destruction of the world, would probably play a leading role in dictating acceptance of the surprisingly liberal Soviet terms. An agreement with the Soviets to mutually withdraw many of the nuclear missiles from Europe has now been signed by the President of the United States. Its ratification by the Congress or by the Senate is imminent. When the missiles are sufficiently thinned out, the preceding scenario or some variant of it is very likely to occur. There remains, however, one fly in the Soviet ointment, the U.S. Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. Presently, Western scientists apply phase conjugation primarily to keep laser energy beams intact and on the target at great distances. They appear to be completely unaware of the electrogravitational aspects of phase conjugation. For one thing, they work at the wrong frequencies for gravitation. That's low frequency. An inventor colleague of mine has already rigorously proven the electrogravitational aspect at low frequencies on the laboratory bench. The phase conjugate time-reversed wave is composed of and carries negative energy and negative time. If the atomic nuclei of an object are continually forced to produce a great deal of this negative energy, negative time, they also produce anti-gravity. This is because in negative time, gravity is a repulsion, not an attraction. 500 watts of negative energy are sufficient to float one pound of steel. In addition, if the electromagnetic energy of a laser is changed into gravitational energy, a theoretical gain of up to 10 to the 42 times is achievable. <clears throat> in practical uh, devices, an energy gain of 10 to the 20th may readily be achieved. Applied to a modified laser in space, this electrogravitational gain factor is of overwhelming significance. In the US SDI, 
U.S. scientists presently envision a high-energy laser in orbit, pumped perhaps by means of a nuclear explosion. The pulse beam from this laser would have sufficient power to destroy a rising strategic threatening ICBM in the launch phase, say at 10,000 miles away. If that same laser were converted to a scalar electromagnetic laser, one that turns much of its electromagnetic energy directly into electrogravitational energy, it could blast and destroy possibly a quarter of a large nation, such as the Soviet Union, with a single shot. Thus, if the U.S. developed and tested the SDI spatial and launch hardware for the space-based high-energy laser, so that these systems were available for immediate launching, the U.S. could convert these lasers to scalar electromagnetics and still possess a very real strategic retaliation capability even if the Soviets should strike the U.S. almost unrestrainedly with powerful TR wave weapons. If the U.S. then launched several of these modified space laser systems when attacked, it could still get off a few shots at Russia and destroy her before all the space lasers could be destroyed by Soviet counterweapons. In that case, mutually assured destruction would still exist and the U.S. would still possess a full last ditch strategic retaliation capability against the powerful Soviet superweapons, even after substantial nuclear disarmament. Gennady Gerasimov, Soviet foreign minister spokesman, confirmed as much on the Peter Jennings ABC News show, Los Angeles, California, on October the 13th, 1986. The real concern with SDI, he indicated, is not with its present design at all. Instead, the Soviet concern is that the U.S. would make a great technical breakthrough and deploy new devices in space as a modification to SDI, presenting an unacceptable threat to the Soviet Union. Gerasimov was almost certainly referring to the potential for U.S. adaptation of the SDI space-based lasers to electrogravitational lasers capable of destroying the Soviet Union. If the high-energy laser weapons stay grounded in the laboratories and the system hardware is not developed and ready, that strategic retaliation capability is lost. For that reason, Gorbachev is adamantly insisting that the SDI defense must not be developed and tested in space. It must be confined to the laboratory. If Gorbachev can prevent the development and testing of the space-based high-energy laser and get the Western nuclear weapons thinned out, he immediately holds the decisive winning hand. The moment he holds it, he will most certainly use it. This is where we are now vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets. This is the background necessary to understand the full context of the present jousting between the Soviet Union and the U.S. and involving the rest of the world. In the Washington Times of August 26, 1986, Soviet Chief of Staff Sergei Akramayev warned the United States that the Soviet Union could have an unpleasant surprise response if the U.S. deploys its SDI in space. He stated, if the United States deploys a shield in space, the Soviet Union will have several options, none of what Washington would wish. The Soviet Union will very quickly find a response of which the United States has no inkling as yet. The leaders and people of the free world must be made aware of these terrible Soviet time reverse wave weapons and their awesome capabilities. The international public must also become aware of the real Soviet threat in time reverse wave weapons clandestine viral biological warfare, and electromagnetic-induced biological warfare, diseases, and death. Strong public support in the free world is necessary for the hard decisions the free world government leaders have to make to counter this hidden threat. Finally, it is absolutely essential that all persons, public, private, and governmental, become aware that the West has already been attacked, both with time reverse wave weapons and biological warfare strikes. The West must quickly learn to defend itself in a totally new kind of war, one that is quite different from any previously fought and one that is not fought on the battlefield. Nuclear disarmament and true peace in the world are dreams that strongly stir the hearts of all the peoples of the free world. However, let us understand that these frightful new weapons, far more potent than nuclear weapons, have already been gingerly unleashed in the world. Prompt nuclear disarmament will only lead to the wholesale unleashing of these electrogravitational weapons against the West. We must not rush blindly after the gleaming carrot of nuclear disarmament when far deadlier clubs are already brandished against us. Let us be fully aware of the terrible danger we all face today. 
Never in all human history has the human species been so threatened. The slightest miscalculation could split the earth or explode the nuclear arsenals of the nations of the world. Let us develop defenses first, then negotiate disarmament and peace that are real. Let the Soviet Union openly reveal the extent of its frightful electrogravitational weapons deployment and testing. Let the nations of the world start a true disarmament process by first outlawing these frightful doomsday weapons, just as Brezhnev suggested 13 years ago. Let us insist on destroying these new superweapons first. Then let us get rid of all of the nukes. For our children's sake and the existence of the world, we must focus the world's attention on the real disarmament problem. We must rid the world of a threat far more terrible than the mind of man has heretofore imagined, to quote Brezhnev in 1975. Despite constantly being told that we live in an age of freedom of information, there are still occasions when governments act without our knowledge, often in the name of national security, such as tests on new weapon technology like planes, tanks or even missiles. Our next mystery concerns a strange explosion in a remote area of the Australian outback, which led one man on a two-year search for the truth. His search took him around the globe, from Washington to Tokyo and Australia. In 1993, the calm of the Australian outback was shattered by an explosion, which registered 3.7 on the Richter scale. Geologist Harry Mason had been working in the region for nearly 30 years. He decided to investigate. I began to research this, but I had no idea where this was going to go. I mean, I was researching a fireball, an explosion, an earthquake, which we thought was a meteorite impact. This has taken me right around the world. It's gone into a, a whole new universe of weapon systems and, and skullduggery and espionage. And uh, I'm afraid the data is tending more and more towards these horrific new weapons of war, which unfortunately most people on the planet don't know exist, and I think it's high time people did know they exist. So what had happened? Earthquakes are non-existent in this part of the gold fields. It hasn't had any in Aboriginal memory or in seismic recorder memory since 1900. So got pretty excited about this. This was going to be a fantastic thing to research. I decided that what was necessary was to get out there in the field to hunt down any eyewitnesses and we're talking a very large area so that was not easy um, but I finally got lucky and located a number of Aboriginal witnesses who had um, seen this whole thing from start to finish. All right, that went. What he saw was a sort of a light coming from the west went straight over the top of us. A whistling noise with it. Just a big bang and lit everything up. Most of them all thought it was the end of the world. What's going on? We heard a bang. And that sort of shook. We had eyewitness reports of a fireball flying through the sky. It was a huge flash of light and a massive earth tremor. Now, it seemed pretty reasonable that a very large chunk of rock had flown in from space and impacted on the ground, and that this had caused the earthquake. And that was the end of the story. From combining all the evidence, Harry pinpointed the location of the explosion to a remote sheep station, where he found another witness. One night I was laying in bed, and next minute this thing started coming over from the south. And it's the ground and made a bank and it's leave the light right up in the sky and stay there for hours. Now, the clincher really is Kelman's evidence for when this thing ended. Um, it turned off as if someone threw a light switch. One moment it was there, the next moment it wasn't. And you're starting to really wonder, um, this is one hell of a strange kind of meteorite if it was a meteorite at all. Um, one way of solving this argument was to actually go out there and find an impact crater. We calculated there should have been a crater of the order of about 100 metres in diameter. And we should have had a significant blast damage area. And we couldn't find it. The area Harry was looking into was Banjawan Station. 
This remote sheep station had belonged to the Yom Shinrikyo, a Japanese religious cult held responsible for the terrorist nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subway in 1995, which killed 12 people and injured thousands. Banjuan Station had been purchased by the Japanese Aum cult. Um, then I heard how the Aum had attempted to purchase nuclear weapons from the Russians and were thought to have attempted to make, to make their own. Well, we started to put all this together and we didn't like what we were seeing. In fact, we seriously began to wonder if they hadn't detonated a small nuclear device somewhere on Banjawan Station. Unproven, but sufficient evidence to suggest someone better have a look at this quick, because maybe that's what we're dealing with. Is that the US Senate? There's sort of a hushed silence at the other end. I knew I'd hit something. It was like, oh Christ, please send everything you've got right now. The US Senate had been investigating the OMS activities ever since the Tokyo subway attack. What we know about the OM indicates that they could, if they put their mind to it and their efforts to it, could develop weapons of mass destruction. The significance of the Tokyo gas attack was that this was no longer a hypothetical threat. The OM Shinrikyo was the first group that used chemical weapons on an innocent civilian population. The genie was finally out of the bottle. They killed people, and they were trying to kill hundreds of thousands of people. In October 95, we were contacted by an individual who brought to our attention the fact that there was a mysterious explosion that occurred at or near where the Ohm had operated. Normally, our, my reaction to an incident like this would have been deep skepticism, but because the Ohm did things that a year or two before I would have thought was total fiction, uh, uh, I had to take it seriously. The Senate hired top seismologists to investigate Harry's report. We were able to determine that it wasn't a nuclear weapons test based on the signature, the characteristics of the seismic signal. And the signature seemed to be more similar to that of an earthquake rather than that of an explosion. The problem with that is we don't normally associate earthquakes with objects flying through the sky, loud noises and bright flashes of light that light up the night. After analyzing the satellite images, well, we haven't found any smoking gun. There's no obvious crater there with a smoldering meteorite. And so if the eyewitness accounts are credible, and it's not a meteorite impact, and it's not an earthquake, then what is it? The Ohm uh, were interested in some very strange and bizarre weaponry, some of which was science fiction. Uh, but with the Ohm, the difficulty was that science fiction and reality were, were very much mixed. And that made them so interesting and also so scary. The Senate had discovered that the Ohm were interested in the work of a scientific pioneer called Tesla. Te Tesla, you say? Right. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Well, instant red flag went up here because as it happens, I'm a bit of a Tesla buff. I have a lot of Tesla's books and books about Tesla. And I remember that somewhere in there, there was some data about creating earthquakes. Tesla had developed a theory, although not proven, of uh, making earthquake uh, machines or weapons that would cause earthquakes through alternating waves and currents. What he's saying is I can flick a switch and I can create an explosion anywhere on the other side of the planet, which you can't defend against. And that explosion is of the same order of magnitude as a nuclear blast. Could this have been an intentionally manufactured earthquake? Um, I don't know of any way of remotely triggering earthquakes. There is certainly no credible scientific or, or geophysical mechanism for remotely generating earthquakes. At this point, a scenario like that would still be science fiction. Two years after he started his investigation, Harry still feels he hasn't found the answer. I'm quite prepared to be wrong. Um, let's, let's look at the various scenarios that may be involved here. Meteorite impact, problem, no crater. Earthquake, fine, but there's a problem. How do we explain the moving fireball and the huge explosion? I'm the only person who's actually taken the trouble to go out to Banjuan, interview the witnesses, and gather the evidence. 
And I am convinced there is something far more sinister has happened out there and is happening in the Australian outback. These are the only traces left of the Ohm's occupation of Banjawan Station. Their leaders are now on trial, but in spite of this, John Sopko believes that the mysterious events in Australia might signal the nature of terrorism of the future. The Aum Shinrikyo itself is no longer a threat. Uh, the Japanese authorities have effectively eliminated that threat by arresting hundreds of individuals, seizing their assets, and putting on trial all of their major uh, uh, leaders. Uh, what still is a threat is an ohm like group that could be anywhere. It could be in England, it could be in Australia, it could be in the United States. And it may not be led by a, a semi-blind Buddhist uh, acupuncturist. Uh, it could be anyone who could do it. Because now weapons of mass destruction can be made by an individual in their bathtub and can be used. And so the motive of individuals and the, uh, uh, the potential for their use is out there.
mind. Why aren't his Hollywood cronies, the people that you always see him with his arm around Sean Pans and the Glovers in the world, denouncing him for this? Because in mm. a sense, if they don't, they're agreeing with him. I think they probably do agree with him because, like like Chavez, they get most of their intelligence uh, about the U.S. government from watching Hanna Barbera cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, though. Yeah, yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> That's true. Uh, uh, Bill, doesn't it really hurt his anti? You know, he has a, a big, heavy anti-U.S. Cr crusade, and when he goes off the deep end like this, it hurts it. He must know that. Well, his PA, his PA, he, he controls the media. So it's not just him saying that. It is tabloids, wall after wall of clever headlines. I can't repeat them because they're in Spanish. They don't make any sense to me. <laughs> All talking about our earthquake machine and perhaps our control of the moon. Like, look, he'll say it and then the media will regurgitate it, Greg. And repetition, repetition, finally the people believe about our earthquake mm. machine. Just and then we sell them one. I love the earthquake <laughs> machine. I saw it on QVC last night. Half off. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, uh, Ron, you have a comment? Yeah, he, I, uh, Bill, he just used restaurant Spanish. I'd love to hear it in restaurant Spanish, you know. <laughs> Was that sort of Spanglish? Earthquake, oh, uh, yeah, pro, uh, machine, machino. P -A -P -A. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, so I'm going to ask PAB one last question about this uh, restaurant Spanish. I don't even get it. All right, uh, PAB, is it scary that this guy runs a country? Or, I mean, the thing is, we don't take him seriously. Right. Well, we don't, but what, I think what's scary is that anybody else does. I mean, the United Nations lets them go on about smelling the sulfur yeah. from President Bush and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's disturbing that he is respected as a world leader. Yeah. Yeah. But it, buy electric cars. I'm telling you, we get 10% of our oil from Venezuela. That's why we're not a little harder on the he fat is, guy. He is your, you know what it is? Why, when I lived in the suburbs, you always had a crazy neighbor. Generally harmless <laughs> until he wandered over to your lawn with a rake without his pants on. Uh, but you couldn't do anything about it. If he did something about it, people thought you were bad for, you know, either calling the police or whatever like that. Chavez is your crazy, demented neighbor who shows up on your lawn holding a rake without his pants on. Absolutely Except right. Except he's in charge of a country. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, well, that's good. Well, well Chav Chavez wears his red shirts all the time because he's Captain Obvious and wants to show us all that he's a communist. Right. My crazy neighbor wore the red shirts because he wanted to hide the blood. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That was always very scary for us kids. <laughs> I bet it was. Yes. From a dictator. Uh, Chavez says U.S. weapon caused Haiti quake. Greg, you think Chavez is crazy. And Patty Ann, you, for some bizarre reason, think that seismologists who speak of these so-called tectonic plates are telling you the truth, even though I'm guessing you've never seen such a plate. Uh, oh, and Kimberly, so Apparently Kimberly, you buy Dan Danny Glover's... Uh... No, no, no. Kimberly, <laughs> you think Chavez is a paranoid schizophrenic. Apparently none of you are familiar with the HARP project. Uh, that's okay. the government's high-frequency active oral, uh, auroral research program that's run out of Alaska supposedly to study ways to improve satellite communications. But those of us in the know are aware that it's really being used for energy weapons, weather control, earthquake induction, and even mind control, Greg. Yes, that's right, mind control. I agree with you, Andy. Somebody passed, somebody exactly. passed the meds around. Bill is wondering how he around. can sign up for this oral research and the, project. And the, and the thing <laughs> is, the you. actual target was probably Cuba, but these things aren't perfected yet. Oh, okay. okay. Well, now we learn. Bottom line is, he's nuts, and yeah. someone else is. The bottom line is, you're all sheep. Yeah. And you just believe that the government doesn't do things like ah. this, like cause earthquakes <laughs> and, and control your mind.